Hello Furs from the web, my name is Scar, and this is the story of the Burned Furs. In my last video, I talked about a more recent event that involved people outside the fandom attacking a convention. However, there are plenty of examples of internal struggles within the fandom's history. The most infamous of which took place back at the turn of the century. Fair warning, this video may become a little incoherent. I'm branching into some old history. Some history that, while it has been documented, has not really been organized. I'm going to try my best to make this as cohesive as possible, but the further one goes back, the harder it gets. Without further ado, this is the story about the burned furs, and why I believe whitewashing the fandom really isn't a good idea. The fandom was in a much different state back in the day. When furries first became an organized fandom, one of the things not on a lot of people's minds was the kind of first impression they were leaving on the world. Want to know where the idea of a sexualized furry fandom came from? It wasn't something the media completely created themselves. Furries at the very start were very public about lascivious aspects, and because of such, that image of the fandom has stood the test of time, still affecting us today. One of the things I want to talk about in a future video is about how divided the fandom actually is, but what is important to know is that furries have never truly been organized. Sure, we have sites that pop up which become big platforms for the community, but that doesn't mean everyone uses them, or that it can be representing of the entire fandom. There is no blanket statement that can be said about all furries, other than we, to some degree, are fans of anthropomorphic animals and that we call ourselves furries. Every person has a different level of involvement in the fandom. Due to the nature of how we define furry, there isn't really a way of categorizing the level of involvement people have. Some people are here for sexual gratification, some for the community, some for escapism. The number of reasons is endless, as is the scale of involvement that we all fit on. But one thing remains the same. We call ourselves furries. The term itself can represent any number of things, and often must be expanded upon. Mixed in with the public view of the fandom, it easily becomes very hard to publicly identify yourself as a furry. Like I said, no blanket statement outside the basic can be said for all furries, yet that is exactly the problem we have. Public reception of furries has granted us a number of blanket statements, none of which accurately describe the fandom as a whole. But simply, it's impossible for any one thing to be said about all furries, and this is also why it's so hard to define what a furry is. What matters is, is that to the public, one thing said for one furry can be usually said for all. This becomes a problem when people have differing views on the fandom, and this is where this movement began. September 1998. A female art school graduate has an interview with an animator. Story goes, she was turned down because she had furry art in her portfolio, and the stigma against the fandom ruined it for her. While this story has never been confirmed, it fits as a spark to what would become. In 1998, a fur by the name of Squee Rat posted an article on his personal site called The Sordid Little Business. This article would become to be called many things, including the tantrum heard around the world and the furry manifesto. The rant-based article takes shots at furries who are into the sexual aspects, lifestylers, those with spirit animals, and more. Initially, the reception was nothing much, but this became part of a spark for a coming movement. Squee Rat wrote this article because of the humiliation she felt, because of the misconceptions that were spread. She and another person named Eric Blumrich grew into critics of the fandom and wished to draw a line in the sand between general furry fans and those they deemed took it too far. Squee Rat and Eric Blumrich became the founders of a movement in 1998 called the Burned Furs. According to their mission statement, their purpose was to improve the mainstream fandom by separating the groups that were involved in the things the general public hated furries for. People into mersuits, bestiality, and plushophilia were all scrutinized. It states, and I quote, It would be easier for non-fans to sympathize and identify with anthro art if these elements are, if not eliminated, then pushed to the far outer fringes and rendered irrelevant to the fandom at large. Essentially, they wanted to clean up or whitewash the people that they believed were hurting the public image. The manner many furries within the movement took to pursue their goal was often questionable. The group faced harsh criticism and often was accused of making death threats and sabotaging events at conventions. The Burn First started out as a group but tried to become a movement. They prided themselves as having no proper leadership and just being a spontaneous uprising. The problem is, with no leadership, there was no clear direction for a movement. 
In response to the burnt furs, a person by the name of Duran Foxtail founded a group called the Freezing Furs. They wanted to be a direct response and put an end to the burnt furs. They believed that they were a little more than a hate group, targeting certain people in the fandom and trying to push them out. They also wanted to open a, quote, real avenue of healing and image improvement for the fandom. The Freezing Furs also had a major problem, though, in that they were still very violent and aggressive in how they acted. This caused a divide in between the two groups that would grow into those who just wanted to end the Civil War. Politics are nothing new to the fandom. Just a few years ago, there was a huge debacle about neo-Nazi furs. Sometimes it just ends up being two loud minorities fighting each other, and the majority of us get caught in the crossfire. From what I understand, the burn furs rose as a very loud minority, and then the freezing furs rose up as another loud minority. The majority just ended up in the middle of the divide. For many people, this just became an annoyance. Groups such as Furry Peas and the Non-Aligned Furs rose to try and end the Great Internet Furry Flame War, as it was called. And thankfully, even if it took a while, the war finally died off. Furry fandom is an escape for many people. One thing often discussed about fan communities is toxicity. Some communities often pride themselves on their openness and inclusiveness. Honestly though, it feels like none come close to the furry fandom. Furry fandom is very inclusive and offers an opportunity for so many people to connect with it. People are here are fans of all sorts of things. Anthropomorphism has a wide history. A lot of people, myself included, believe there is a point where we must draw a line. This movement decided that the line belonged between safer work and non-safer work. But the truth is, as much as we don't like to admit it, there is a heavy element of the not safe for work side to the fandom. Like I said before, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's been present since the fandom's inception, and which was part of the reason the popular misconception of old furries are about sex happened in the first place. While I can empathize with Squee Rat, I don't believe the action she took was the right one. Yes, the interviewer was incorrect in their behavior, but not all people are like that. And sometimes we have to understand that maybe leaving something off our portfolio might be the right call if we're worried about someone reading it the wrong way. If you think we shouldn't have to do this just because of the misconception, you're probably right. But the reality is we have to acknowledge the world's current perception of furries and not just pretend it doesn't exist. As far as whitewashing goes, it kind of goes against our fandom. Trying to erase such an admittedly popular aspect just because the general public overblows it really doesn't fit our inclusive nature. The line may need to be drawn, but that's not the correct spot. So on that note, where do you guys think we should draw the line if it needs drawing at all? Not safe for work material, Nazi furs. I understand this is probably going to be a controversial question to ask with controversial answers. So I want to ask everyone to do their best to be mature in the comments. It's a hard question. Anyway, thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.